Oh, hey. You know, I'm sure many of you are at the age where you are driving. Well, if that's the case, you want to be safe behind the wheel, right? You want to have your seatbelt on at all times, at least when you're driving. You want to be paying attention to the road. That's why I've stopped to talk to you. Now, one of the other things that you might consider is an airbag in your car, and you might have one in the driver's side and probably the passenger side as well. But how is it that these airbags that have to inflate to about 50 to 60 liters can actually do that? So I think we understand the idea that an airbag inflates, but before we can explain why it inflates, and you know there's some chemistry in there, we've got to get a bit of a background in one thing that we really haven't talked about involving gases so far, and that is the amount of gas. You see, so far we've talked about pressure, temperature, and volume, and the relationship that exists between those three things, yeah, remember the combined gas law? But what we're going to take a look at is one variable that we held constant in all of those gas laws, or at least we didn't discuss, and that is the amount of gas. And going back to a balloon, which is something that I think we've all, again, had exposure to, blowing up a balloon sometime in our lives, you understand that if you want the balloon to get larger, you have to blow more air into it. So this is what we've come to know as Avogadro's hypothesis. That is, the volume of a gas is proportional to the amount of gas and the number of moles. So the more moles of a gas that we have in there, the greater the amount of gas, the larger a volume that gas is going to occupy. Now this is going to help us start to explain how we can go about figuring out how an airbag works. But there's also some other relationships that we haven't taken a look at yet. And those two relationships are going to allow us to figure out just how much gas we have in a particular scenario and all of the variables that are related to that amount of gas. And we refer to this as the ideal gas law. Now what is an ideal gas? Well, an ideal gas is just, in short, one that behaves ideally. That is, it follows all of the gas laws and doesn't interact with other gas molecules and behaves just nicely for us so that our calculations will work out. Now it's important to note that gases aren't going to behave ideally, but at least for our evaluations, we have a pretty good sense in these relationships how gases are going to behave. So while they don't all act in accordance to the ideal gas law exactly, it certainly is valuable for us and relevant for us as we go through evaluating gases in these initial studies of chemistry. So as I said, there are two quantitative relationships that we're going to take a look at involving this concept of ideal gases and really just the amount of gas involved. So we've looked at pressure, volume, and temperature as a part of the combined gas law, but they also take part in something known as the ideal gas law, where N equals pressure times volume over temperature, but also includes this constant that we refer to as R. Now it's important to note that this R constant is going to be different depending on the pressure unit that you use. Now we're always going to evaluate an ideal gas using liters as our volume unit. We are always going to evaluate it using um, Kelvin as our temperature unit, and we're always going to evaluate it using the number of uh, moles of gas as our amount of gas. So those ones are not going to change. But our pressure units, as we've learned, could be in millimeters of mercury, they could be in kilopascals, or they could be in atmospheres. And the R value, cha R value changes accordingly to each one of these pressure units. So there are three uh, R values that you're going to have to know for each one of those three different measurements of pressure that we are going to use. And so, as you can see here, the N equals PV over RT, or PV equals NRT, as it's sometimes seen. This is the ideal gas law that we're going to use when we start to factor in the amount of a gas. Now, we have one little shortcut that we can sometimes use, and that is when gases are at standard temperature and pressure, or standard ambient temperature and pressure. That is a set of standard conditions that scientists have sort of come up with to test different various uh, properties and different various chemical reactions. And so they've assigned standard temperature and pressure and standard ambient temperature and pressure as a couple of combinations of temperature and pressure under which reactions can take place. Now because of this, there is another variation of the ideal gas law that we can use that involves something called molar volume. Now molar volume is the amount of space or volume that any gas occupies at a specific temperature and pressure. So for standard temperature and pressure, we have a molar volume of 22.4 liters per mole. And for standard ambient temperature and pressure, we have a value of 24.8 
liters per mole. Now what this allows us to do is use an equation very similar to the kind of the setup of the n equals mass over molar mass except this time we're using n equals volume over molar volume. So if we know the volume of one mole at STP or at SATP, if we know the volume of that gas and we know that it's at STP or SATP, we can use the molar volume to figure out how many moles we have. So this is another variation of the ideal gas law but can only be used under STP or SATP conditions. Now what this allows us to do now that we've talked about the amount of gas and moles, and I think you know where I'm going with this, we can start to use these relationships to help us out with gas law stoichiometry. Yep, back to stoichiometry. So if we take a look at a stoichiometry problem like, ooh, let's say this one, we can see that, well, we have something called sodium azide. And this sodium azide is going to become relevant for us in just a second. But notice here that we have a solid. So we're going to not use the gas law here because a solid isn't a gas. And we are going to figure out the number of moles using the molar mass of this particular substance. Now there's only one reactant here, so we don't have to figure out the limiting reagent. But of course, if it was a limiting reagent scenario, we would add this step in as well. And you can see here that we get two products in this decomposition reaction. But notice that one of them is a gas. So as we go through our mole ratio, our mole conversion from our moles of reactant to our moles of product, and now we want to figure out the amount, let's say the volume of gas that's going to be produced, we can now use this relationship of PV equals NRT or N equals PV over RT to figure out the volume of that particular gas that's going to be produced. So again, it's just another layer added into our stoichiometry. And so what it allows us to do now is evaluate these heterogeneous uh, systems where we have solids forming gases and vice versa. And so now we can use a whole bunch of different relationships, mass over molar mass, concentration times volume, uh, PV equals NRT, to now evaluate a whole bunch of chemical systems and allow us to figure out masses and concentrations and volumes involving solids and solutions and gases. So it's just one more layer to our stoichiometry. So how does all of this help? Well, to be honest, um, I just kind of wanted to fit in the, the stoichiometry there. But it does help if we were trying to figure out the volume of gas that was produced when an airbag expands. So let's take a look at the equation that I just had up on the previous slide. Yeah, that one. That is the equation for how an airbag works. You see, in the airbag itself, there is a compound, a solid, called sodium azide. Now, when there's an impact detected by your car, the sodium azide reacts with the potent oxidizer to decompose to produce nitrogen gas. And now notice this equation here. We have a solid and then we have a gas. So initially we have a solid packed into a very tight area and then we get a rapid production of gas in a one to three ratio. That is one mole of solid producing three moles of gas. And so we have this rapid expansion of gas as a result of this decomposition reaction, it's this rapid expansion of gas, this nitrogen gas that fills the airbag. Now there are holes in the airbag, so almost as quickly as it's filled, it, it starts to empty so it gets out of your way. But ultimately, it's due to the rapid production of gas in this decomposition reaction. Now let's say we wanted to figure out just how much gas was in an airbag. Well, we could use the amount of sodium azide that's in there to figure out what volume of gas is going to be produced to occupy that airbag. And scientists could use this to figure out just how big an airbag they would need or how much sodium azide they would need to fill that airbag. So there is some chemistry and some, yep, stoichiometry going into figuring out how much sodium azide is needed to fill those airbags in your car. Hopefully now you have an understanding of how to use both methods of the ideal gas law in order to figure out the amount of gas and how they're involved within gas law stoichiometry. Thanks for watching.